Good morning, everyone, and we're glad you're able to join us today. Uh, we're going to wait just a few seconds to get started um, and give, give our guests today all a chance to sign in. So um, if you'll hold on for just a few moments. We'll uh, be ready to roll very shortly. All right, well, again, good morning. My name is Fred Clark. I'm the executive director of Wisconsin's Green Fire. And we're joined today by Green Fire Science Director, Sarah Wilkins, and by two of our co-hosts, Wisconsin Green Fire members, Carrie Behealer and Gary Radlaw. And three uh, expert panelists with a really nice variety of perspectives on energy issues. Uh, Scott Coonan, Dick Cates, and Camille Kadush, and we'll introduce all of them in just a few moments. Uh, for those of you who are Green Fire members, uh, thank you for being here, and we're glad to provide this opportunity for you to learn more about some of the work that we do as an organization on, uh, on natural resources policy and on energy policy. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here. We appreciate your interest, and we hope that you find this program valuable. Wisconsin's Green Fire is an NGO that supports the conservation legacy of Wisconsin by promoting science-based management of our natural resources. Our Wisconsin's Green Fire members work throughout Wisconsin on issues including wildlife, fisheries, forestry, water resources, agriculture and conservation, working lands, the science of climate change, um, and our path to renewable and smarter energy. We encourage you to learn more about Green Fire at our website, and you can also follow us on social media, and this program will be available uh, both on our website and our YouTube channel uh, once it's completed in the next couple of days. Now, for those of you joining us, I want to just point out uh, a couple of features uh, as Zoom webinar attendees. Uh, if you look at the upper right corner of your screen, uh, you should have a control button on your own screen that will allow you to uh, switch between options for viewing. And, and there'll be a ability to minimize your screen or to maximize it, as well as to select between uh, uh, gallery view and a speaker view. So you can explore those options for the uh, format that will be uh, most useful for you. Um, also, we will be inviting all of you to submit questions for our panelists for the last third or so of the program today. And the way to do that is if you look down at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, you'll see the Q&A feature which I'm highlighting here. Um, submit your questions using the Q&A feature. Just pop that open and submit a question. You can feel free to do that at any time. You don't need to wait till we begin the questions. Um, and Carrie Behealer will uh, moderate our questions and we'll try to get to as many as possible through the course of the program. Um, finally, if you're having any technical issues, uh, you can't hear well, something on our end may not be working. Um, or you need support for something that we can help um, other than a cold beer, uh, submit a question or a comment in the chat box. And uh, we'll try to track those and, and make adjustments where we can.
So uh, our moderators today are, are Gary Radloff and Kerry Bahila, and both of them active members of Wisconsin Green Fire. Gary is the principal of the Radloff Group, which is a policy research consulting firm. He previously was the director of Midwest Energy Policy Analysis for the Wisconsin Energy Institute at the UW-Madison. Uh, Gary's also served as a director of policy and strategic communications with Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. Carrie Behealer uh, is a co-chair of our energy policy group, and uh, Carrie has a long history in conservation, including uh, time as the Wisconsin DNR Wildlife Health Specialist, where she was responsible for investigating and evaluating wildlife diseases. Carrie has been involved in pathology, diagnostic, uh, health, wildlife health investigations for nearly 40 years. She's also, um, as I can attest, very active in Wisconsin Audubon, the Dane County Parks, Wisconsin Breeding Bird Atlas, and a num number of uh, outdoor and environmental initiatives. Uh, and she co-chairs our energy policy group along with Gary. Uh, so Gary, I'm gonna turn it over to you from here uh, to offer some comments and introduce our other panelists. Thank you very much, Fred. And if um, anybody has any technical difficulties or questions, I'm trying to monitor the chat box um, um, as well here as I go. Uh, we wanted to uh, welcome you to our webinar. And the webinar is kind of a continuation of some work that we started at Wisconsin Green Fire uh, when we published uh, an energy white paper, uh, Securing Wisconsin's Energy Future. and uh, you know, the focus of that white paper was, uh, I think, twofold. One, sort of recognizing that we have many new technologies in the energy space, but the policy world maybe hasn't really kept up with uh, the infusion of those new policies. And especially here in Wisconsin, I think, uh, as our panelists will probably note, we might be a little bit behind the technology curve, and we're definitely behind the policy curve. A lot of these new technologies, uh, there's an awful lot of names out there around them, you know, grid, grid edge services, smart systems. Uh, the one that is commonly used is distributed energy resources. Uh, sometimes non-wire alternatives falls into that category. And these are things like energy storage, uh, modern demand response, which is a little different than historical demand response, uh, kind of modernized energy efficiency steps, microgrids, and lots of what are called smart technologies, smart thermostats and the like, et cetera. Uh, what I think these new technologies do or combine to do is really give us as energy consumers tremendous new opportunities to have a new supply demand energy paradigm and then become what's the term is commonly used as prosumers. And, uh, so I think it's an exciting time, but it's also like any time of change, a little bit disruptive and it takes everybody a little while to get used to that. Um, I think the, one of the first steps in with all of that is, is uh, under what's called grid modernization. Uh, very simply, that's usually involving advanced metering, kind of uh, an opportunity to have cloud-based IT uh, data storage for analytics of energy use. Uh, certainly two-way data communications and two-way electricity communications. Uh, and smart technologies really, I think, are uh, an exciting opportunity. The state of Illinois is, has really moved ahead on those uh, and sort of provide a pathway, I think, for Wisconsin to look at. And I think it re represents a, a significant investment, but a smaller investment than new capital expenditures of new generation and new transmission. So I think it's something that we need to look at. It'll allow us to really have uh, things like real-time metering, real-time rates, uh, you know, things that we just aren't even really thinking about to, to some degree now. And so uh, hopefully uh, here in Wisconsin, we can just start a discussion around what we would like that to look like and what we would also like our energy system of the future to look like. I know we talk a lot about, about renewable energy these days, and that's really an important critical piece of this that our panelists will touch on. But I, I tell people I like them to think beyond the solar panel and the wind turbine too. Energy efficiency and demand management really are equally important because our system, uh, energy system is sort of massively overbuilt because of uh, those reasons. And so I think we need to talk, think about 
you know, even like green heat technologies, heat pumps, combined heat and power, district heating, hydrogen, biogas, and, and these smart everything, smart thermostats and the like, to really, again, kind of promote this uh, new supply demand paradigm that is, is developing out there. But we really do need some policy to drive that. And so in our, in our white paper, we talk about a number of policies like performance-based uh, rate making, which is, I think, really critical. We use what's called cost of service regulation right now. And cost of service regulation tends to kind of separate out things uh, from the customer in somewhat uh, perverse ways. And it, it, it uh, causes the utilities, again, to, I think, overbuild and, and sort of create a system which has uh, tremendous inefficiency. With performance-based rate making, we could actually very clearly state our Wisconsin policy goals to someone like the Public Service Commission, and then those policy goals could be built into uh, the payment for our utilities. And we can expand on that, but it just, I think it's an, a, a critically important policy. Another one that I find kind of intriguing is something called community choice aggregation, which is now in nine states. And it basically empowers local governments to, to really set their own energy agenda, including the procurement of energy uh, uh, through, usually through contracts. Uh, California is probably the furthest along in this area, but uh, New York has over 50 municipalities that's in its community choice program. So that's again, another policy that I, I think we, we need to think about here in Wisconsin. Uh, and then finally, I just think in general, we need to find ways to get the public much more engaged with the Public Service Commission. Uh, it, it seems now that there's a little bit of an detachment that you feel like you have to have an attorney to talk to the commission. Uh, and I think they need to form some citizen committees uh, to, to look to the future and to modernize our system. So that's just a very brief overview of the white paper. I hope you'll take a look at it. It's at the Green Fire website. Um, and, uh, We'll talk some more about some of these things, but I want to introduce our panel because that's why you're here. Uh, and I um, appreciate their participating in all of this. Uh, Scott Cannon is the executive director of the Wisconsin Conservative Energy Forum, which is a nonprofit that was launched in the fall of 2017. Scott leads all of their efforts in Wisconsin as a, providing a voice for conservatives in state energy policy and to focus on advanced advancing clean and reliable, affordable, renewable energy. Uh, this organization approaches renewable energy from right of center and really has a free market perspective in order to foster and common ground uh, on our energy issues. Our other panelist is Dick Cates. Dick and his wife, Kim, are the co-owners of Cates Family Farm in Dodgeville and Wyoming Townships in Iowa County. It's a grass-fed beef operation and a contract grazing business. Dick is a lifelong farmer, and he has been in the Iowa County area most of his life. And he earned uh, his, B, his MS in soils at Montana State, and his PhD in soils and plant health at UW-Madison, as well as serving as a Leopold Fellowship. And I know Dick from his days at the, on the DADCAP board. He currently serves on the Driftless Area Land Conservancy, and he's going to talk today about the development of the Greater Iowa County Clean Energy Alliance. Our final panelist is Camille Kadouche, who is a member of the Global Policy Group and serves as general counsel at the Regulatory Assistance Project. Uh, she, she supports RAP's work on climate-related issues, utility regulation, energy efficiency, She's most recently focused on issues related to performance-based regulation that I discussed earlier, energy efficiency obligations, no regrets planning, and beneficial electri electrification. Prior to that, joining that organization, she worked in private practice. She holds an undergraduate degree in biology and environmental studies from St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. And she graduated with her law degree and a master's in environmental law from Vermont, Vermont Law School. So to get started here, um, I think is Scott, and I will pass the baton to Scott. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Gary. I really appreciate it, and I appreciate everybody taking the time to uh, kind of 
you know, listen to us as a, as a panel and, and hopefully have some good back and forth and Q&A. Um, I'm going to move through these slides really, really quickly because I always thought the, the Q&A is kind of the most exciting and best part of um, kind of doing these online panels. So my name is Scott Coonan, um, Wisconsin Conservative Energy Forum. I kind of come from a political and policy background. Um, I'm going to try and approach this issue. Uh, I, I, I'm conservative and I come from that area, but I'm going to try and approach this as in kind of a pragmatic, middle of the road approach um, to kind of hopefully foster some middle ground on this issue um, and where we think both sides can come together and make some progress for Wisconsin. Um, but we are a conservative organization, as you can see, um, the folks that make up our leadership council and board of directors have been involved in policy and politics for a, for a very long time. Um, and our approach to this issue is we needed a, a conservative voice um, in the energy policy debate because one didn't really exist um, before that. Um, especially in Wisconsin, we're in a state where we haven't had a lot of um, political discussion or policy debate about energy issues. Um, it hasn't been very robust in the last decade, decade plus. Um, so we think uh, we kind of fill that vacuum and are trying to come up with um, you know, principles and, and policy ideas that can guide us forward in this energy transition we're in. So I'm gonna to touch on renewables for a, for a little bit, but then hopefully get into a larger discussion and kind of set up a 30,000 foot view for us. So next slide, next slide, please. So our principles are, are fairly simple and um, we think that these are largely popular with the American people, right? We look for things that are market driven, um, that are cost effective, and that can be economically viable, um, both for the actual power sources, but also for, for businesses that are trying, businesses and residences that are located in the state. Um, and also we look for energy technology that can make us independent. Um, independent as a country, more energy independent as a state. And actually at the end of the day, as Gary touched on, um, you know, what energy sources and technologies can lead us to be independent as individuals, as households. Um, which is kind of an exciting thing about renewables and some of the technologies that I hope we're going to be discussing. Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, is it reliable and conducive to economic growth? Those are principles that are all, I think, again, largely popular um, with the American people. Um, but we need to apply those principles to markets that are fundamentally changing. Um, please, next slide. So what is changing? Um, the changing landscape here in the last five to 10 years has, is, it's been this tremendous, tremendous cost decline in renewable generation. Um, it has been absolutely huge. Um, as you can kind of see, and as probably a lot of people know on the call, you know, wind and solar are largely cost competitive and new build, um, even with natural gas at this point, um, and especially with coal and some of the older line um, uh, energy producing facilities. That is a huge change. I mean, it, it's just taken hold in the last five years um, and it is taking, and to me, it, it flips the entire debate that we've had about renewables and we've had about new technologies in the last 10 years. It flips the whole issue on its head um, and should fundamentally scramble the political alliances and the discussion that we're having over this issue. Uh, please, next slide. So for us, uh, you know, one of the main one of the main things we're trying to get across as an organization, um, you know, especially again to conservative and more right of center audiences that are uh, maybe traditionally a little bit more skeptical of this. Clean energy is actually the cheapest form of energy you can have uh, on the grid at this point. Um, and that is just, a, again, it's a tremendous, tremendous issue. It was challenging for me personally uh, to break out of the arguments that I had made in the last 10 years. I, I've spent the last decade of my time arguing strenuously against renewable energy. Um, I've employed a lot of a lot of the arguments that you're probably familiar with and hear on a regular basis. Um, and it was really uh, I, learning um, what was happening in the marketplace and taking the time to kind of get to know things turned the issue for me personally on its head, um, which I think is exciting, but should also lead us to, to break through into new areas of policy, into new areas of thinking. So please, next slide. So we kind of go through what we think the conservative or even the business case for renewable or alternative energy is. Um, and, and from a policy perspective, we're not necessarily talking subsidies. Um, and we're certainly not talking subsidies on a par with fossil fuels. Um, we're not talking inefficient man, man, government mandates. Um, and at the end of the day, we're not even really particularly pursuing the climate change or environmental benefit um, side of things. Uh, for us, the, the real business case here is falling price, it's versatility, rural economic development. Um, a, a lot of the build out that we do for renewable energy is going to be tremendously beneficial economically to rural parts of the state. Um, and then at the end of the day, business and consumer choice, grid diversity, national security, 
all of these reasons are broadly, again, broadly popular with both sides of a political spectrum and actually can equal things that we, we largely share. Um, both, again, both parties across both aisles. Um, so again, markets are changing. Our reasons for supporting these things can change too. Please, next slide. So this is what Wisconsin's future looks like. Uh, Gary touched on it. We are nowhere in the state on a transition. We're 10 to 12% bouncing around that um, in, those, um, in those percentages for renewable energy generation, including hydro. Um, I think right now, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 megawatts of install, installed solar capacity all across the state of Wisconsin. Just in the next five years, next three to five years, we anticipate 6,000 megawatts of solar coming online, something that's gonna hugely change um, our energy landscape in the state of Wisconsin. So please, next slide. So right now we really view renewables as disruptive technologies. Um, that, that's gonna have to change the way people on the right think of this. It's gonna have to change the way people on the left think of it as well. Um, I, I really urge people don't get caught up in an all or nothing argument, over 100% this, 0% that, um, too often, especially at the national level, we let politicians talk to us as if we're dumb. Um, and, and we can't get caught up in that argument. Um, and at, for, for our purposes here, I really think there's a three-legged stool in Wisconsin that we need to be engaged. We need our regulators at the Public Service Commission to focus on these issues more. We need our policymakers across the street at the Capitol in Madison to be way more engaged than they've been. And at the end of the day, we need all stakeholders, including utilities, cooperatives, NGOs, everybody needs to be involved and we need to sit at the same table to talk about some of the issues that we have here. But for the, for the most part, we think that policy in Wisconsin right now, as Gary kind of said, is lagging behind technology and it is having a negative impact on investment and economics in our state. Um, so please, next slide real quick. Um, but at the end of the day, what I really urge people, you know, from our perspective, we need to be realistic. We need to recognize challenges. And at the end of the day, you know, you need to really push for solutions. There are a lot of problems that come up in this transition period. Um, and, and policy needs to be engaged in solutions. So I'll leave it at that. And I look forward to the discussion. Go ahead, Dick. Okay, I got to see my first slide. So again, I'm Dick Cates. I come to this as a citizen, this subject as a citizen, as a rural landowner and business owner in Iowa County for uh, my family's been here for more than 50 years on the farm that my son and daughter-in-law are taking over uh, now for the past three years. Um, I agree with everything Scott has said. Um, the ground is shifting and our policy is lagging behind. What we need is engaged citizenship. And I think that all change that's healthy, productive, and long lasting comes from the ground up. And so in thinking about a clean energy future, we look to our neighbors in Northeast Iowa that have been at this effort for about 10 years. And you can see the logo down in the right hand side that comes from Iowa. What a shake county was the leader in this effort of developing a clean energy district. So what is it? A clean energy district's a local institution. Currently in Iowa, they're nonprofit 501c3s. They don't have to be. Uh, they're, they're defined by county lines. That's the way we are starting our effort in Iowa County. We don't have an energy district. We have a group of concerned citizens who is investigating that as an alternative. They're created to strengthen communities by leading, implementing, and accelerating the locally owned clean energy transition. And the second point doesn't address the question, what is an, a clean energy district? It, it, does, it does address our mode of fair access to locally owned clear, clean energy is a win-win uh, for community-wide energy prosperity. And that we have many members in our uh, effort who are first concerned about climate stewardship. But I believe at core is the wealth building aspect of our local rural economic, um, uh, economic communities. So the next slide, thanks. So we call it a community building effort, a mission. And we look at it as in these three things. Um, and 
individuals will prioritize one or the other. We've got a big tent and we're willing to have everyone who wants to pull the same rope put together. So affecting the local economy by retaining and investing, reinvesting energy dollars to positively impact climate change. And another way of saying that is reducing our carbon footprint uh, by promotion of wise energy use. And I believe that in the future, uh, carbon exchange will be an economic driver and to facilitate fair access to clean energy, local energy. Those who need it the most should have access. Go ahead to the next one. So this is, this is the big concept to what is an energy district? Um, it, well, it's modeled on the Soil and Water Conservation District. They started in the 1930s and they were a response to a significant environmental need. Farmers were losing their soil, their ability to produce an income. And the um, conservation district, which is now so widespread, we don't even recognize them as being in place. They're in every county in America. They initiated here in Coon Valley, Wisconsin, in the Driftless area in 1933. And Aldo Leopold was one of those individuals involved in that. Uh, they were local and voluntary, quasi-governmental. Um, there's federal involvement uh, through eventually federal funds. There's technical assistance. And um, uh, as I say, there's 3,000 of them in the United States. If you heard in the background, that's my peanut gallery. That's my soon-to-be three-year-old granddaughter. So <laughs> she always has something useful to say. Okay, next slide. So this is my last slide, but I want to, I want to um, emphasize that what we're really talking about is the development of uh, a fair and equitable uh, local renewable energy future. We're talking about connecting with Main Street businesses and farmers, with contractors to perform energy efficiency measures. That's the low hanging fruit, um, especially LED lighting. And here it says solar power generation, should just say renewable power generation. And for these, again, I'm in some ways summarizing to decrease carbon emissions, um, saving money, local dollars, and stimulating the local job market. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, it's a very inspiring time. I, I feel that a lot of uh, folks such as myself, we're not, the, we're not honestly the experts like, like uh, a lot of the folks on this uh, program today, but we're, we believe in the democratic process that citizens can make a difference. And so we're getting engaged and we're finding uh, a broad audience. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Dick and uh, uh, Camille, go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, as we mentioned, my name is Camille Kadosh. I'm with the Regulatory Assistance Project. We're a global nonprofit that is based in Vermont. Um, and we provide technical advice to policymakers all over the world on how to achieve a clean, cost-effective energy transition. So we are technical experts. Um, Scott talked to you about renewable energy today and the importance of uh, growing um, a clean energy source in Wisconsin. And Richard talked about clean local energy and the importance of energy efficiency. And energy efficiency decreases the load that we need to serve with that renewable energy and other energy sources, which is very important. I'm going to be talking today about electrification, which is about electrifying previously fossil fueled end uses. This includes heating, cooling, and how we drive. And um, so electrification is electrifying end uses that were previously fossil fuels. So this is your natural gas heater in your basement, furnace, or air conditioner. This is your internal combustion engine vehicle. All of these can be electrified by transferring to heat pumps um, and also to electric vehicles. 
So at RAP, we talk about beneficial electrification, a subset of electrification. And there's three components that I'm going to talk, to, talk about when we talk about beneficial electrification, which we posit is beneficial to society as a whole. And those three components are that it saves consumers money over the long term, that it reduces environmental impacts, and it enables better grid management. So when you think about these things, heat pumps or electric vehicles, we say it consum saves consumers money. And this will be sometimes a state or local determination of whether or not it does. Um, but it saves consumers money over the lifetime of the appliance or the vehicle. Um, it includes the cost of the purchase uh, and maintenance of the vehicle or the appliance over the long term. And it includes incentives that are offered to decrease the cost of new technologies, which are frequently more expensive than existing technology. Um, and it also includes utility bill savings that can be realized by um, changing when you uh, charge or when you use the grid. So that's the, the saves consumers money point. Um, electrification measures also reduce environmental impacts when they have lower emissions than before by electrifying using the energy sources that are on the grid now, if it uh, lowers the emissions than it had previously. Again, looking over the lifetime of the product and including the grid flexibility that it enables, which is the third point. And this is a policy component as well. You can electrify, you can have heat pumps, you can have an electric vehicle, but if you don't have the policy that requires and enables communications that tell you when to charge your car so that it's better for the grid, um, those, the electrification isn't as beneficial. So flexibility to the grid operator is huge, in part because we do want to integrate large amounts of renewable energy, but we can't control when the wind blows or when the sun shines. Um, but we are able to control electrified devices. So through communications to you, the consumer, or to fleets, we can say, look, it's better to charge at night when there is plentiful wind, or in the middle of the day when there's plentiful solar to soak up that energy and use it more cost effectively and more efficiently. Next slide, please. So what I'm talking about here is how beneficial electrification devices are cleaner, they're generally more efficient than their fossil fueled counterparts, but that's not a static determination. At the start, depending on what resources are powering their grid, they might be dirtier, depending on the region. But over time, they will get cleaner with the grid. So left hand chart here shows a natural gas water heater, and a natural gas water heater will always be powered with natural gas. But the heat pump and electric resistance water heater, which are electrified, will get cleaner with the grid. So as the grid incorporates more renewable energy, um, becomes more efficient, and the resource mix becomes cleaner, the effect will be that the electrified devices overall will be cleaner. So on the right-hand side is um, a chart from the Wisconsin Office of Energy Innovation from 2018 showing the Wisconsin grid. And we're okay, we're not great. Um, 2008 was actually the high point for coal. But next slide, please. The impact of this is that an EV in Wisconsin, I plugged in my zip code in Stevens Point, but it shows all of Wisconsin, um, a electric vehicle or a plug-in hybrid today with our current resource mix is cleaner than an internal combustion uh, vehicle. So I ran, you'll note that the battery electric is slightly less clean in terms of carbon emissions. So I should note that electrification isn't only counting carbon. It looks at um, sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxides, um, and improved water uh, use as well are some of the environmental benefits. But you'll note here that the battery electric vehicle is slightly less clean than the hybrid, and that's due to Wisconsin's energy mix. I ran this same tool from the Union of Concerned Scientists with looking at Minnesota, 
and it's 200 grams of uh, CO2 equivalent. I also ran it for Vermont, where my office is based, and it's 96. So the what is on the grid matters. And that is it. Questions? Gary's still on mute. Okay, Carrie, I think you're live. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Camille and Dick and Scott. You guys are great. Um, what I would like to do now is we have a plethora of questions. Um, and I know we're kind of short of time. So with all due respect, what I'm going to do is just take them as they have come through in the queue. And the first question comes from Chris, and it's directed to all of our panelists. And perhaps um, each one of the panelists could spend you know, one to two minutes answering this question. Um, and we'll go in, in the order of um, you know, Scott to Dick to Camille. The first question for you all is, whoops, sorry. Oh my gosh. Learning the technology, sorry. The first question is, in the description of this webinar, it was stated, modernizing Wisconsin's electrical grid will reduce energy waste, increase energy efficiency, and reduce the vulnerability of disruptions. What specifically is meant by this statement? So first to Scott. Yeah, so, so this is a broad reaching uh, kind of question, right? And, and I think uh, we, we need to answer it in kind of a, uh, again, go back to those principles. Um, you know, what are, what are the technologies and what are the goals uh, of what we want to do? Um, you know, we, we've spent 100 years, 150 years building the infrastructure that we have now. Um, and the, the question should be really fundamental to us. Again, what are, what are the principles that want to drive us moving forward. I, again, I'm excited by the idea of um, cheaper energy, uh, less expensive energy. Um, and, and to be able to do that, um, I, I think we've identified some of the things that need to happen um, going forward, right? Um, and that, that includes energy efficiency as well, right? As, as, a, as a main thing, because the, the cheapest electron, uh, you know, um, is the one you don't have to use, um, right? So, so energy efficiency has to be a, a component of that if, you're, if you care about the price and, and efficiency of your energy. Um, but also, again, one of the things I'm very, very excited about are, are individuals having more control over their energy production and their energy use. Um, and that, I don't think, uh, that was not a principle that we cared very much about uh, maybe 100 or 150 years ago when we started down this line. Now, um, now, as, as people, as, as you know, kind of folks, you know, concerned about this, um, we can push for technologies and we can push for things to try and meet that principle. Um, so again, I'd, I'd answer that question in, um, in a, in, with our principles. You know, what do we care most about? Um, and then what technologies and what combination um, gets us to, to meet those principles best? Great, thank you. Taking that same question to Dick, what do you think it um, modernizing the Wisconsin energy system means in specific? You bet. Well, again, uh, I could cut right to the chase and say I agree completely with Scott. Um, when we originally electrified America, uh, we had immediate goals in place, and that was to get uh, electrical current out to rural places so that our dairy farms um, our businesses could modernize. We, we had vibrant, vibrant rural communities. Most people were self-sufficient. Uh, there was a vibrant main street every 10 miles down the highway, and we had different goals. We, uh, we developed that system very effectively. We changed people's lives for the better. We're at a different juncture now, and I agree so completely with Scott. We're Individuals are looking to take some control over their energy future. And the reason is, yes, we're concerned about climate change, carbon footprint. But look at Main Street and many of our rural communities. We need opportunities. We need options. And we look at this as one of those. I'm going to give you quickly examples of what it looks like specifically in Winnipeg. County where they've been at this for 10 years. They've invested 14 million in local investment in energy efficiency and renewable energy. 
they've created 100 plus jobs, they've reduced 100,000 tons of carbon emissions. And what's priceless, and I will underscore this, is a rapidly growing community-wide energy stewardship and prosperity identity. It gives people hope. Well, great, thank you. Camille, can you have a chance to answer that question as well? Yes, and I will add to what they said. We have a century old system, both with the generation and the infrastructure that is built up. We also have a century old regulatory and policy system. So the policies that are in place currently, just because it has grown up over a century plus, is to reward the investor owned utilities. How they make their money is by one, selling more megawatts of energy and two, return on investment on capital investments. These are the incentives that are inherent in the system through no fault of anybody's. This is just because it was built to make it bigger, to sell more energy, and at that time it was cheaper. That is not the case anymore, and so our policies need to be reformed to reflect that. Think about it. Utilities lose money on energy efficiency measures because you use less megawatts of energy. Also, their, ret their return on investment, on a capital investment for a solar field or a wind farm, is just going to be smaller than it would be for a coal plant or a natural gas plant. Those, the existing incentives in the system need to be evaluated, and we need to evaluate as a state, as stakeholders, as policymakers, do these still align with what we want? And we now have new technology, new resources that are able to be accessed easier and cheaper. So yes, we need to modernize our grid and our policies to achieve that. Yes, excellent, thank you very much. Um, I just wanna let everyone know that um, we are using the, the Q&A box to ask questions. Um, I see a lot of folks are asking questions on chat and we're not gonna be able to cover all those. Um, the wonderful thing is we've got a plethora of questions and I know that we won't be able to have our excellent panelists answer all of them. So on this um, screen that you're looking at right now, there are the names and contact information for all of our panelists and also for Wisconsin's Green Fire. And I think if, um, you know, this is going to be recorded and so this is going to, this program is going to be in the archives. But in the short term, if you have specific questions that we won't get to today, um, go ahead, please, and, and contact either Scott or Dick Cates or Camille Kadosh um, at their rep, um, respective affiliations, and you can ask your questions to those folks directly. Um, the wonderful thing is we've got great questions. Um, the, the bad thing is we're, I know we're going to run out of time. The next question I have is, again, to all of the panelists, um, and it comes from Paul, and his question is, using the um, coronavirus in a positive manner, Using this downtime, don't you think that we could transition to a more renewable future rather than go back to the old energy paradigm? This is a time to think and reconsider and come up and, and put into place all those wonderful policies. And I'm going to go with Camille first and then Dick and then Scott in order to answer that question. Thank you, um, a good question. We've been thinking about that quite a bit. Um, and I'd say that the first focus should be on energy efficiency measures. Um, right now, we sadly have empty schools, um, a lot of empty hotels, um, other areas that um, through energy efficiency investments which could, um, and measures could perhaps be done um, while those buildings are not otherwise occupied. Um, there is also some groups that are looking into virtual energy audits to be able to determine what kind of energy efficiency upgrades are needed, um, which again, accommodate the current, um, the current restrictions that we have in place um, just by nature of the virus. Um, so I think there are certain things that can be taken advantage of during this time. Um, and then also thinking of investments that can be clean, local, that can um, benefit local economies to build the infrastructure that we need for the clean energy of future. So this could be EV charging infrastructure, which leads to clean local jobs, um, 
and puts people to work as well. There's many other distributed energy investments and infrastructure that can happen um, to realize the goals that we all have. Great, thank you. Moving on to Dick to answer that question. Sure, well, we certainly, uh, during this corona period, we certainly do have more time to do webinars and uh, to mull and contemplate change. Um, so we should use it wisely and uh, uh, we get to interact in a productive ways with, with individuals. We get to know only by seeing them on a screen, but it's, it can be very rich. Uh, to answer your question with a specific example, I heard of a very cool, cool example uh, recently where I believe it was the AmeriCorps group uh, in Iowa, um, but if it wasn't, it, it, it does, that detail doesn't matter. Um, the, there was an encouragement to change out from incandescent light bulbs to LED light bulbs, and volunteers would would uh, have a set of addresses where uh, uh, individuals, youth from the school lived, and they would uh, deliver an LED light bulb to the front steps of a home uh, with the promise, um, this was all school um, organized, with the promise that uh, the next day, uh, and, and the LED would be picked up and installed and an incandescent light bulb would be sitting on the porch for, for return. What a, what a unique idea. So there you go, social distancing and social change. Yes, on a, on a small scale and the small um, individual, you know, opportunities, you know, taken together are what we're gonna allow for change. So Scott, can you um, answer that question as well in terms of what can we do with this coronavirus downtime to um, make sure we don't go back to the old energy paradigm? Yeah, I, I thought a lot about this myself too. Um, stuck at home, you know, tens of thousands of Americans are dying, you know, millions, tens of millions are losing, losing their livelihoods. You know, who cares about solar panels? Um, I, that's a, a hard question to answer. Um, and, and I've tried. Um, so I, I think a couple of things can drive us as we move forward. There, there's no doubt this was poorly timed, you know, especially from the renewable energy industry, um, even battery storage, electric vehicle transition. This was really a poorly timed thing um, because the the industry was just, I mean, we were just starting to really ramp up, right? Um, you, you have this kind of confluence of, again, consumer demand, economies of scale. Um, you know, we were just starting to get to the point where shovels were getting in the ground on really large projects. Um, and so, so this is a poorly timed thing because a lot of our uh, particularly renewable investment and, and this infrastructure investment, I mean, it, it requires capital upfront. Um, and an economic recession or depression that we're talking about um, may very well flush capital out of the system um, that we would need to, to move in. So I, I think there are a couple of things that we can keep in mind. Um, right now, the, the federal tax subsidies, particularly on the renewable energy side, are, are poised to phase out over the next couple of years. Um, there's discussions taking place in DC about possibly extending those subsidies given the fact that the renewable energy industry is not in a position to take advantage of them um, going into a hard e economic recession. Um, so so there, are, there are some things that we can do, but you know, largely I think policymakers um, in, in an economic recovery are going to be looking for industries to pick on and to seize on. And renewable energy, electric vehicles, storage, some of these new technologies that we're talking about, all the things that made them growth industries before, you know, pre-COVID-19 will make them growth industries post-COVID-19. Um, so I, I think there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel on this in that you know, a lot of the underlying uh, market dynamics and economic dynamics behind the drive towards renewables and some of these new technologies, uh -huh. those will still be around in a post-coronavirus world as we look towards economic recovery. Great, thank you very much. Um, just to let you all know, we've got a number of questions that we won't be able to have the panelists um, answer at this point in time. However, we are um, capturing all of those questions uh, via screenshot. And what we're gonna do then is collate those questions and come up with written answers. And those answers will be on uh, the Wisconsin Green Fire webpage. 
it will probably have it under, um, we've got different categories on the, on the web page, and it's called What We Do, Our Work. We'll have those answers to the questions that you folks have asked underneath that, um, the energy work group, what we do. And so the last question that I'm going to um, give again to all of the panelists to answer, and, and then we're gonna have to wrap up the webinar. And um, we'll start with Scott since he just got done answering it, answering the last one. The question for all the panelists is, can the panelists share their thoughts on how Wisconsin utilities can rid themselves of their uneconomic fossil fuel assets that they have long-term investments in? Yeah, this is a good Scott. Yeah, absolutely. This is a great question. Um, and I think it, it's going to be central to what we do in the next 10 to 20 years. How do we move out of uneconomic old assets? Um, again, Camille touched on it. We have been, you know, we, we are in an old paradigm and new technologies don't necessarily fit both our regulatory and policy framework, but also the economic framework on the ground. Um, that, that is going to be tremendous. I, I'm in the camp of, I, I don't want to see our utilities go bankrupt. Um, so we are, we are kind of in this situation where you don't want the burden to fall entirely on shareholders of utilities, but you recognize that utilities probably in some cases made some very, very bad bets and some bad business decisions. Um, so, so there are some policies, I, I think very, very highly of economic securitization. Um, and to me, that is a fundamentally conservative kind of market oriented policy reform that you can put in place to make it easier for utilities to move out of old assets and into new. Um, and I think that that's a very, very positive thing. In the state of Wisconsin, I genuinely believe that that policy measure could form a cornerstone or a basis of a very large energy policy uh, package of legislation that we could move forward. Um, I, I think the world of securitization, and um, it, it's a little bit hard to kind of get into the weeds of that policy, um, but, it, but at the end of the day, it really makes this transition a lot easier on both shareholders and consumers and rate payers, um, which is really the sweet spot for policy, I think. Right, great, thank you, Scott. Um, Dick, would you like to answer that question as well? It is, um, can you share your thoughts on how Wisconsin utilities can rid themselves of the economic fossil fuel stranded assets? Sure. Uh, first of all, I also agree. Uh, the, the utilities have served us, all of us, diligently and uh, necessarily in a, in a very, very significant manner. Um, we're at a, a different, we're at a juncture of change in our, in our, in our society where renewables make more sense. I do not want to see our utilities the only ones that suffer. Everybody's going to suffer a little bit with trying to figure it all out. But this is, this is very typical in business. When I started farming, I sold all my dad's old farm equipment. I didn't need it. Okay. It's part of life. And we have to realize that we have to have to have empathy and we have to help. So, um, you know, the, 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 the really, the companies that are really on top of it have already moved to, to renewable generation. They're not standing in one place. Uh, at the World Economic Forum that took place earlier this winter in Davos, some of the largest corporations in the world were talking about positioning themselves to become leaders in, in renewable energy. So it's, it's the way of the world. And I think as citizens, we all want to help those who have helped us. Great. Thank you, Dick. Camille, your turn. I'm going to speak a little bit more on the, the broader policy level here um, versus specifically to Wisconsin because this is happening um, all over the world. But I think it will de um, regulators would need to determine a little bit on um, the each individual utilities um, integrated resource planning, how long the planning has been in place to make these decisions. There's questions on prudence, um, those types of things as well. Um, and decisions on how to deal with those strat stranded assets will need to be made utility by utility um, with regulators, with the policymakers as they look at what type of planning was in place and all of those types of things. Um, Certainly this is something that the world is grappling with, so there's certain uh, best practices that you can look at from other parts of the world um, as well as we're looking at this. Um, but certainly I do believe that utilities are starting to think of other ways to deliver energy 
um, in a clean, cost-effective manner and in a way that requires good forward planning through integrated resource planning, distributed generation planning, all of that type of planning helps to reduce the stranded asset scenario later. Harry, uh, if I could jump in on that after Camille for just one second, I know we're looking to wrap up. Wisconsin actually doesn't have an integrated resource planning process, um, which is very, very unique and an outlier um, as far as all of our surrounding states and, and everybody around the country, essentially. Um, so I think there is a, a point, uh, Dick is absolutely correct. Um, I, I, nobody wants to throw utilities under the bus, but also as, as consumers, um, you know, as voters, ratepayers, um, there is a position in Wisconsin where I think we need to demand a little bit more transparency um, and some more outside involvement in the process that utilities do go through when they plan their long-term resource plans. Um, that, that is something that I think is going to be central in Wisconsin as we go forward because we miss that process entirely. Great. Right. Excellent. Yes, thank you very much, Scott. And now um, with just a few minutes left, we're going to send it back to Gary for a final wrap-up. Thank you all for all your questions and they will be answered, um, just not at this time by the panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you so much to our panelists. A, a great discussion. We covered a, a surprisingly large amount um, within our hour. I just mainly want to say that uh, to our uh, over uh, 70 people who joined throughout the webinar, uh, you know, we can continue uh, this discussion to the extent that we'd love to see you participate and work with us on the Wisconsin Green Fire uh, Energy Work Group. Uh, you can uh, contact Carrie and I, and we will have some activities, uh, uh, hopefully similar to this in the future. We also, <coughs> excuse me, we're also looking at some uh, uh, other types of white papers, maybe more specific on individual policies that we touched on today uh, and the like. And um, uh, hopefully uh, very soon, all of us can get together in person. Um, so uh, happy to, to work on some of these questions as our first assignment, but uh, please feel free to join us uh, going forward. Uh, you don't even have to be a member of Green Fire, although you certainly should be. It's a great organization. Uh, and, uh, uh, I hope to uh, speak with uh, more of you uh, soon. Thanks again to everybody. Great, yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gary. And uh, for everyone who took time to join today, we appreciate your interest. Uh, we hope that we've just touched the peaks of some important issues. And I think the fact that you're willing to spend part of your day with us shows the importance of this. Um, so we'd, we'd love to hear more feedback from you all about this event. You'll be getting an email from us, uh, those of you that signed in uh, tomorrow, uh, inviting you to participate in the survey. Give us some feedback about about what you heard today and about uh, future topics that you think would be of interest. And um, on behalf of all of us from Wisconsin's Green Fire, thanks for your time. We're wishing all of you a safe, enjoyable, and uh, 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 as much as it can be in this uh, period that we're in, uh, a successful holiday weekend. Um, and until next time, um, uh, stay tuned and thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Yeah. Yay.